I feel like I owe a lot to Linda and the Linda Pace Foundation for their support. And she was one of the first supporters uh, that really put their money where their mouth was in terms of arts and the local community. And importantly, she kind of put local artists on the same level as well-known international artists and just really brought the community up. I feel like my work is very inspired by San Antonio and South Texas and Mexico uh, in particular, and I'm kind of uh, melding that with contemporary art. Truman Capote once said, you can do two things. You can come to New York and completely reinvent yourself, or you can bring where you came from with you. And I think that that's what I did. I think I brought South Texas to New York. I mean, New York doesn't need one more New York-like uh, contemporary artist. I think what makes it interesting is people are contributing and bringing where they came from, who they are, and adding to that. I think it makes it much more exciting. So the Ellen Jones furniture pieces that I kind of translated were inspiring to me and very complicated at the same time because during the time that he made his pieces, there was a, a big feminist reaction. Uh, so it was problematic for me at first. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it because I'm a feminist. So, uh, but since I was reinterpreting them through kind of the Mexican-American experience, uh, I thought that that would make it interesting. And also when you're afraid of something, um, if you think something is tough to tackle or you're afraid of it because like say the anti-feminist issues in Ellen Jones, I don't think you're supposed to run away from that. I think you're supposed to figure out what you're going to do with that. And I think that the job or the responsibility of an artist is to figure out how to interpret uh, both the spiritual and the visual and physical world that you live in. So for the production of these pieces, uh, impossible for me to do because I live in a tiny apartment in New York and it's all these toxic chemicals and stuff. I asked my cousin Carlos Cortez if he would help me to fabricate this work. He has Cortez Studios in San Antonio. It's not the normal work he does, but uh, we cast these figures from Mexican-Americans, uh, live figures, and then they're cast in resin, and they were spray painted by a wonderful woman named Chris, who is a firefighter here in San Antonio and an excellent airbrush artist. Facebook likes uh, is are some of the first paintings where I'm translating my humorous slash political populist uh, sayings uh, onto actual canvas. So yes, they deal with like, they kind of poke fun a little bit, the Facebook painting of like artists, the, the popularity of artists and you know, the kind of how they've now become kind of these kind of celebs and and also all the whole likes thing, the whole like syndrome. It's like everybody just wants to be liked. And that, now there's like this, because of Facebook, there's this competition of who has more likes than the other. So it has that humor while incorporating the language of, or, or the look of serious text-based art. Uh, I'm Exhausted uh, is a painting that looks like 1950s, 60s New York abstract expressionism. It only has a few strokes on the corner because the idea is that I'm exhausted. And it is exhausting uh, to have a day job, live in New York, and try to make it as an artist. It's quite exhausting. And so I remember in a writing class, a teacher telling me, of course, everyone's heard this, write what you know. So what I knew and what I felt then was so completely exhausted. And plus I liked it because uh, it did look a little bit like very conceptual abstract expressionism just to put a few strokes on a canvas. Um, and it was interesting from a formal point of view because when you start painting, when you lay down five or six strokes and you stop, it's really easy to be pleased with it. But the more you go on, the more painterly problems you have to solve. So I stopped before I had any painterly problems. Uh, I mean, it had to resolve any painterly issues. So it was like kind of liberating. The least amount of words that an artwork requires 
the better. And I think that the color field was a happy accident. And I'm in San Antonio and it's Fiesta week. And during Fiesta week, they use big giant crepe paper flowers, which are like Mexican marketplace souvenirs. And I had a bunch in the studio. And so I just put them on the pedestal beneath the painting. And I thought, why not celebrate this very, this culture? And I thought it was a little risky to incorporate them as a contemporary art uh, medium, you know, crepe paper flowers. But deep down inside, the truth is, everybody loves giant crepe paper flowers, bottom line. And, uh, and the explanation of that painting, and whether they admit it or not. And, so, and the, so the bottom line explanation, if there is one of that painting, one, it's joy, a celebration of culture. Two, it's also saying that it's okay to like austere color field minimal painting and Mexican crepe paper flowers, that it's okay to like both. The inspiration for the It Takes a Village piece, the structure starts out kind of as a modernist architectural model or a glass house within the museum space. It's a piece that I've created on site for this show and it's a new piece, so I'm still figuring out what exactly the piece means, which I think is important um, you know, I don't think you always have to know exactly what everything means, uh, but I think you eventually figure it out. Uh, but I think in this case, I'm incorporating works of cement, uh, folk art pieces that were created by uh, Carlos Cortez and by his father. And again, it's celebrating local folk culture. And then I've kind of done minor interventions, creating these kind of surreal juxtapositions, mixing pop with the folkloric, uh, it's got this kind of Fellini feeling, so there's this Mexican village and Juan Diego is going up the mountain to speak to the Virgin of Guadalupe, which was an invention to convert the Aztecs to Catholicism. But here he just confronts a giant pop art lipstick mouth. I've used a marble statue from the 1700s of a Greek or Hellenic figure that I've turned into a local legend figure, La Llorona, and explains her history. Uh, she drowned her children in a river to be with the man she loved. He rejects her and uh, she then uh, kills herself in the river. So you hear her moaning and wailing by rivers. Her wailing is also seen as a premonition to the fall of the Aztec Empire. All of that, is it kind of important? Yes, I think it's important to bring lore and folklore especially from this region to and to inform younger people that are attending the exhibition about the folklore and legends and history of the culture that's important and i love that i can do that through contemporary art the calder tapestry is a copy of a calder tapestry i think you have to copy artists work that you love in order to really internalize it and to learn from it i saw the calder tapestry and i loved it and i thought god i would love to have that so I made one, and that comes from ersatz culture, from Mexican-American culture, where if you don't have something, you just, you're resourceful, and you take whatever materials are at hand, and you make one. So, uh, so it's the calder, and it says, it makes a reference to Rene Marguerite, this is not a calder. But is it? I mean, it's all the whole value of art, because it's exactly like the calder. It's woven tapestry, hand-dyed wool. It's, it's exactly as calder would have made it. So it, the object itself is actually a calder. It's, it's the whole, it plays with the whole question of value and value systems.